Peace everyone, Unmaskart here, and welcome back to another live critique session. I got a lot of really great artwork to go over today. Uh, as you can see, Udon's down there moving in his little cool cave. You guys don't get to see him move too often. Um, anyways, so first up we got this lovely portrait, uh, colored pencil portrait. At first I thought it was a graphite, but I guess Dorothy did... Uh, uh, black colored pencil and probably some gray colored pencils and whatnot of um, mm, Professor McGonagall, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this this one came out really good. Now there's there's some obvious things that I'll have to point out to help you um, improve. But overall, the one thing that I wanted to mention is how how well you did with the variety of textures that exist. So real quick, let me just point some of those out to you. Um, the hat up here, it's sort of a fluffy kind of texture, and you did a really good job at capturing that, that sort of short hair fuzziness. And you do that with really short dashed lines and dots um, and, and good use of the highlights, the negative space there. And that can be difficult to do with, with colored pencils. Overall, you can see that the dark shape of the fluffiness is a bit more broad. So this is all rather dark, where here you have a lot of light highlights coming in. And that might have been an artistic choice just to sort of make it brighter or make it more textured. But I, th I really think you should have... Uh, stayed true to the shape, the dark shape of the reference photo, because uh, it sort of distorts the light direction here. And overall on the hat, you have a little bit of the light source being obscured. So the really dark shadow that runs up here like this, so this all should have been, should have been black here. I suppose I can maybe... Um, grab a brush really quick to fill in that, that dark shadow. So let me do that really quick. So this, this should have all been dark here along this side. This helps establish the light source because as we can see in the reference photo, the light source is coming from the right. And then also underneath the brim of the hat, another layer of the black would have, would have done a lot to help smooth out some of the textures because there's not really any texture that you see on the underside of the hat. And you can see how just uh, going with one more layer sort of covering the graininess from the uh, colored pencils would have just darkened that a bit better. And then same thing with the fuzziness. If you bring this shadow over more, and then here's the, the light source hitting it a little bit. So you get a little bit closer to the reference with just with the hat by itself. Uh, now for the, the shirt here, one thing that I liked is how her pendant really stands out. And again, I think you tried too, too much to get these wrinkles. And truthfully, those wrinkles aren't really that important. It's more important to capture the values and the changing of the values and had you gone darker on the shirt, even, even if it's just darker like that, I think that it looks better because now the pendant sticks out really, really well. And if you wanted to stay light on the jacket or the cloak, uh, because you have such lovely texture here, uh, it stands out more as well. So now the hat is darker, this undershirt turtleneck is darker, the pendant sticks out more, and the lovely texture that you worked on for the cloak also stands out and looks better overall. Hey there, Susan, uh, Diane, Cindy, Kizzy, Tori, Cherry, John, B, Alicia, good to see you. Um, so those are just a few minor things that I, you should consider in the future. Uh, if you're going to change the value of any part of the object, make sure you have a good reason to. In this case, having a lighter turtleneck I don't think works really well, and then also not darkening the left side of the hat and also smoothing the underside of the hat a bit more. I don't think that that helped the drawing. I think that it 
took away from it. And with just a couple minor changes here, it just it, it looks a little bit more polished by by having those things altered that way. Now, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the drawing accuracy. In this case, the, the drawing accuracy isn't too far off. Um, it's pretty good, but the, the eyes are a little bit big. The eyes are a little bit big. The nose is a little bit too short. Uh, so if I just grab a quick color here. So if we look at the nose, the top of the bridge, so the top of the bridge down here, if we just draw a rectangle and we do the same thing over here, you can see that these rectangles are different sizes. Uh, this one's a little bit longer. So you, you sort of shortened her nose and it shows up quite a bit when you, when you look at it. Uh, her eyes are obviously a bit bigger here and um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's okay to sort of play around with the, the size of eyes sometimes. Um, but then the other thing is her mouth is too narrow. So her she has a, a wider mouth here in the reference photo than she she has in the drawing. So when it comes to likeness, you, you captured the likeness just enough to make her recognizable. Before you gave me the reference photo, I knew who this was, but partially due to the uh, clothing, sort of because I, I'm familiar with Harry Potter, uh, I was able to recognize her. But if I wasn't, if I was only recognized, recog, uh, if I was only um, familiar with the, the actress here, then I most likely wouldn't recognize her if it weren't for the fact that I'm familiar with Harry Potter. So uh, be very, very careful with your drawing accuracy. Also, um, if you see like the turtleneck here, it comes out, sort of creates this cylinder around the neck here. And if you look, your turtleneck stops right here. So you're missing, you're missing this portion here of the turtleneck. Um, and instead you have like the collar coming up, which that's not the way that it would look. Uh, the turtleneck would hide that side of the collar the way you see it here. See how the turtleneck comes out and then the little bit of the collar and then you see the shoulder and you can also see that you have her shoulder up here, but if you look over here, her shoulder is way down here. So this uh, discrepancy in the anatomy also makes her shoulder um, look a little strange. So um, just practice your, your drawing a little bit. Uh, use the grid method if you have to. Um, you don't have to freehand it. You can trace it as well. But uh, if you're practicing drawing, then don't trace. Um, just practice drawing. Uh, get good with the, the grid method to the point that you can use less, less grids. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about uh, is the shadows on the skin. Again, even when we're working monochromatically, people struggle to they they struggle to to go dark with the skin and uh, you you went pretty dark here on the bottom of the nose which is okay her her nostril is uh her nostril is a bit too tall it needs to be flattened just a little bit cuz it sort of looks like you can see right up her nose whereas you can't see right up her nose both nostrils are too big. Uh, I would say when it comes to nostrils, better to make them a little bit too small than too big. Uh, nobody wants big nostrils, so just be careful with that as well. Uh, I'm going to take this dark color here and uh, let's just let's just fix the the shading on her on her face here. So uh, there's a dark cast shadow from the hat, as you can see. And then the whole right side of her face, whole right side of her face is in shadow. Like her hair's here, you shouldn't really be able to see. And then it comes down and then her neck is really dark. This is gonna also bring her chin forward. So as simple as that, just not being afraid to go dark here, 
The difference is that this is very two-dimensional face, where with a bit more shading, her face just becomes more three-dimensional. So don't be afraid of those values. Uh, check and double check and check again. Uh, and then with skin, now you can do the same thing with color pencils as you can with graphite, but with graphite, you usually erase, but with colored pencils, you know, come back with a little bit of white and touch up the highlights, the brightest parts of the face. That's going to make the face the full three dimensions that you need it to be. So a little bit on her underneath her eyebrows here. And that's just going to make the face a lot more three dimensional. I'm not going to do too much with the face, but as you can see, here's the before. Here's with just going another layer, darkening what needs to be darkened in the clothing. And then here's just adjusting the values a little bit in the face. So as you can see, it's it makes a pretty big difference with just very small uh, changes and considerations. But thank you for the submission, Dorothy. Up next is Diane, and she did the My Neighbor Totoro project, and she absolutely nailed it. Uh, this looks fantastic. I know she was working with a limited palette of the pan pastels for the background and for the mixing it, I mean, it came out perfect. Like I honestly wouldn't change a single thing about the background or anything. Um, it, the details in the foliage here look really, really good. They're, they're soft, but the ones up close are nice and crisp and look good. Um, the inking looks really clean. Uh, I like the thicker lines. I wish I would have went with thicker lines on mine. Uh, it looks like you smudged the um, the pastel on the handle here a little bit of the umbrella. Um, the colors look spot on. Fantastic colors. You you did a, di a different blue on the sign than I did. You went a little bit more towards the light blue like the original. Um, I think the sign could have a little bit more aging to it. I do remember having some browns, a little bit of rustiness in there. This part of the sign looks good. Uh, the cement block looks fantastic. Yeah, everything here looks really, really good. The colors on Totoro look fantastic. Uh, great inking here with the lines uh, above the nose. The eyeballs look good. Um, whiskers, everything. A little bit of smudgy weirdness happened here on the belly, but it's not too noticeable. It's fine. Um, good cast shadows. Yeah, good color on the ground, good texture. Yeah, everything looks fantastic. I I, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, this is, this is really, really good. Uh, careful with the lines here. So the reason the, uh, so the reason the raindrops are not visible here is because the light source is illuminating the raindrops. So you have the raindrops being illuminated by a street sign that's off to the left. You don't want to make this line too obvious here. So you sort of, you sort of stopped this line almost too straight. Um, a little bit more variation in where these raindrops start is going to make that that line, let me just draw the line that I'm talking about, um, the line that's going right here. Uh, all the raindrops sort of follow this line. It's just a bit too perfect, if you know what I mean. But otherwise, yeah, spot on. It looks fantastic. I have nothing other th to say uh, than, than that as far as correction goes. Everything looks really good. Uh, and Diane also submitted uh, the hair project. Um, this was obviously part of the tutorial uh, on, on coloring hair. Um, Diane, you have to let me know how you, you, I imagine you follow the steps that I did in the tutorial, like to the letter. Um, how did it feel? How did, did you change the colors at all? Did you, you pick your own colors here, right? Oh, you were trying to figure out, you didn't know why there was no raindrops there. Yeah, that's that's why there's no raindrops, because the raindrops are being illuminated by the light. Yeah. 
Yeah, going dark is always a struggle, Cherry. I totally understand. Anyways, the, the hair here looks really good. Uh, really good dark shapes. Um, there's not so much obvious highlights, but they were subtle in the reference anyway. The the texture looks good. The flow looks the flow looks pretty good. Now there's some room for improvement. Some let me just uh, show you what I mean here. So it, it it can be tough to make these smooth curved lines look really smooth and curved. Uh, you have a little bit of boxing, so you, it's where it's where the lines aren't perfectly flowing. You know what I mean? It's it's hard to describe, but think of like a wave. Like when a wave is curling, all the lines are really smooth, uh, and they, they there's no like wiggly jaggedness. That that's gonna take some time to develop, but some of the lines just have a little bit of a boxiness to them where the the curve is a little bit flat and then it curves smooth and then it like has a bend so there's a few few bends in the curves like here's a good one this one sort of does this thing there's a few bends and getting those natural curves is probably one of the most difficult things about doing hair uh, other than that the dark shapes look good. The texture looks really good. The flyaways look really good. You could probably add more flyaways to the outside. Uh, I feel like you are a bit timid with the flyaways. Um, the hair here crossing the face could be a little bit chunkier. So there's a few there's a few thicker strands or bands of hair that come through the face like this. Um, and the flyaways, so you can add the flyaways over top. So um, yeah, it's it's not bad. It's not bad at all. It's it, This is really, really good hair uh, in comparison to a lot of hair that I've seen in colored pencils. So um, yeah, a bit, a bit more practice and you'll have those smoother lines. And yeah, like I said, don't be too timid about the flyaways, especially the ones that stick out up here these ones you know everybody has them with the, with their hair so it's just going to make the hair look a little bit more natural uh, but this this looks good yeah this looks really good um i can see a, like maybe some like reddish purple almost in the toning color so good choice on the toning color you could um you could maybe go a little bit darker on the hairs here so some of these hairs just feel a little bit too bright, considering how deep they are in, in the back of the hair. Um, the Some of the transitions here are just a bit too hard. So like this dark line right here, and the way that these hairs like just sort of abruptly stop there, it's a, it's a bit, uh, it's kind of a pinch point. Yeah, this, this like shape here is a little bit of a pinch point. Um, maybe having some flyaways cutting across it. So if you had like, um, let's try to grab a, like a lightish color here. So if you had some flyaways that sort of cut across, that's too, that might be too bright. Let me go with this color. So if it's just some flyaways that cut across like this, uh, that's going to hide some of those pinch points. So um, you can use anywhere anywhere a shape feels a little awkward, you can use some flyaways to distract the viewer from what lies underneath. Flyaways can, can have a, a really big impact there. Um, uh, uh, some light flyaways coming across the dark hairs down here, if I zoom in a little bit. So having some flyaways that just sort of do this kind of thing. Uh, adding that little extra layer of texture is just going to give the hair a bit more realism. So again, don't be too timid about the, uh, the flyaways there. Otherwise the hair looks really, really good. Yeah. You did a, you did a fantastic job on the hair. Keep up the good work. 
All right, up next is Linda. She has this uh, lovely triple portrait slash landscape. Uh, she did this of a photo. I'm not sure all the relatives, grandmother, mother, niece or something. I'm not sure all the relatives that's in the in the photo, but this is a really great photo. Um, it was a low quality reference. I, I remember seeing the reference. I can't remember where it was at, but I, I remember she posted the reference somewhere. I think maybe it was in Discord. Um, but I didn't see it on Facebook, so I, I don't have it here in front of me to um, for a comparison. But I don't think I really need any comparison here. Uh, the the quality of the reference photo creates sort of a unique style to the artwork because it sort of has this. Um, it sort of has these missing details that you would have in the old in the old photo and i think it works really really well now one thing i want to talk about is lighting so this is definitely a bright day out uh, you can even see the clear blue sky a little bit in the back um and i think what you could have maybe consider doing and I'm just going to grab a dark bluish color I guess so I'm going uh, you'll have to forgive this this is going to look really bad at first so you have some cast shadows here so you have some cast shadows here so I'm just going to darken this you have some dark cast shadows here, and then it sort of continues off. Something like that. Just that alone. You see the way it just makes them pop out even more? I think you could have gone a lot darker with the cast shadows. Even just, even just that yeah, so here's the original, and here's with just darkening that cast shadow. It just makes them stand off the page more. It, it brings more intensity to the light. Uh, the same thing can be done on them as well. So if I were to take that same, uh, that same thing, and the light source is clearly coming from... Why is there no color on my brush? I hold on a second. Why is there no color on my brush? Oh, that's because I was on the eraser. <laughs> That'll do it. Um, so the intensity of the light would also fall on them. Uh, and let me do this on a separate layer here. So uh, you can see some cast shadow a little bit um maybe it's maybe that's her arm cast shadow it's hard it's hard for me to tell exactly but across here now i'm going to fix this just give me a minute and across the face underneath uh, cast shadow from the head everything here Maybe on this side, it's it's I I don't have the reference photo, so I'm just sort of creating the cast shadows out of nothing. But let's put this on multiply and lighten it up a little bit. Yeah, so this this gives more intensity to the light. Now this is just a quick scribble, but adding those dark cast shadows on the left side. It, again, it just reinforces that lighting. And then the the last thing that I want to talk about with this is uh, going darker in the shadows in the back. So in the bushes, I, I you have some dark color here. I would have liked you to utilize this to create more shape and dynamic to your foliage in the back. Um, it would just look... It would just look more realistic it would look better if there was some dark shapes in the back and then also 
the whatever this is supposed to be uh i guess this would be like a beach maybe and then some trees these trees are far too vibrant this is like the same color of green remember as objects get farther away the value and the saturation decreases so all of these trees and stuff should just be faded blue they should be everything back here should be closer to the sky color and the sky color i think could be a little bit brighter also the the sky color could be a bit a bit bolder um and maybe even the water i guess this is water there's no real sign that it's water but i'm i'm guessing that it's water uh remember to use horizontal lines for skies and water that's in the background use horizontal sky or hor horizontal lines to hide the texture of the pencil more layers in the background uh, to get it smoother as well get rid of the grainy texture a bit but otherwise uh, this is a really fun project and you, you did a great job on it thank you linda again here's the before here's just some mild changes all right up next is cherry she has this beautiful rose done in pastels um yeah there's there's not a whole lot to talk about this uh it's just so good um not really anything that i would change about it uh i think the texture here the pattern i think you can get rid of this at least mildly you know have some stuff there but overall it's just better flat let me do that on a separate layer oops yeah so i'm just going to grab a color here and sort of erase some of the extra texture that you have um just a little bit so you can still see it but just soften it a touch uh, because it's not it's not an important feature the rose is obviously the focus here and it's just a touch distracting because it it just has too much and it almost feels repetitive uh, a little bit so if it was just softened toned down a touch i think it just brings more attention to the rose which is where you want it anyway now with the rose itself uh that is the brightest red i've ever i've ever seen um it's actually hard to look at it so bright um but i think the the shadows could use just a touch more blue in them so the rose being a bit more of a purple color in the shadows so let me just and I'll, I'll i'll toy around with this a little bit let me just add this purple really quick because this is far too much purple but you want to add some blue to it so let me just desaturate that a little bit let me go on with a multiply. That might be too much. There. Yeah, just a bit, a bit of purple. And then also, there's not a lot of variation in the gradients. Uh, in the rose so you can see a little bit on these petals here so if i just zoom in you can see a little bit of the gradient if i just grab that color and move it a little bit more towards purple if i just sort of add a bit more gradient to some of these petals they're just going to look smoother they're going to look softer and have a bit more dimension to them so some of the shadows just feel a little bit too light this one's this one's pretty good you have a nice texture here in the petal uh, but here this one i think this one would benefit from having a little bit a uh, longer gradient for the shape you know what i mean uh, just to give it a little bit more shape as far as the the changing values of the rose uh, i'm being nitpicky here because the rose is indeed so well done but the background just 
tone it down like a little bit and then add a little bit more to the gradient of of the rows my eyes are actually hurting from looking at it it's it's so bright it's so bright um sorry i'm trying let me try to uh, catch up the chat If I happen to miss any questions, please let me know. Yes, indeed, a very bright red rose. Uh, all right, yeah, fantastic work, Cherry. All right, up next is Susan. She has this graphite uh, portrait of a dog. Adorable, adorable uh, Yorkie, maybe? Sort of looks like a Yorkie, maybe a schnauzer with a haircut. Um, or some kind of mix, some kind of terrier, right? Um, and Susan, uh, you mentioned you don't really work in graphite, so this was a little bit outside your comfort zone. And that's okay. You can use all the skills that I talk about in colored pencils. You can actually use those in graphite as well. So, you know, matching values, making all of the artistic adjustments that, that I discuss in all of my critiques, um, you know, texture, controlling texture, because here, here, the control of texture would make a really, really big difference. Now, I think there's a little bit of glare on the photo. I think you had it framed and maybe, I don't know if it was framed behind glass, but there's a little bit of a glare running through here. So I'm not going, I'm not going to be able to like nitpick too much about the, um, uh, about the values like running through here, but Overall, the the drawing accuracy looks good. Yeah, the drawing accuracy accuracy, accuracy uh, looks good, um, but it's it's more or less the the composition of the original photo versus the drawing. Now, the composition of the drawing is is good. Um, you have sort of the third rule of thirds uh, working out pretty well here. So if we just sort of break this up into thirds, uh, you can see that uh, you can see that the eye sort of is right near this intersection. It's closer to here, uh, right near this intersection. This is a really good place to have the head because it intersects at that, uh, that golden rule there. Um, so compositionally, it's really well done. I think what I think where it it struggles is the uh, texture. So uh, remember that there are three types of contrast. So there's there's value contrast, there's saturational contrast, and then there's texture contrast, and obviously here you're not working with any saturation so you don't you don't have saturation uh, contrast to to consider but you have texture and value and value wise you're you're in the right place you have a lot of really dark values and you go all the way up to the really dark or really bright values and that's good you need that especially when you're working with just monochromatic uh, mediums here. The next contrast, texture con contrast, is going to make a huge deal. So if I uh, grab my my blur tool here, and let me see if this, if I can get this to work well, and I just start blurring out the texture in the background, this, the way that you would do this with graphite is just by smoothing it with a blender you can use the sponge blender, you can use a piece of tissue wrapped around your finger, you can use a blending stump, you can use whatever you want. Um, I'm going to I'm going to blend the and everything except the dog itself. So I'm going to just smooth out the texture. That's all I'm doing here. That's all I did. Just by smoothing the texture the dog stands out more so here's with here's without it here's with it 
maybe I can. So here is without, and here's with. It it it's just barely smoothing out the texture of the background and a little bit of the foreground. The dog just immediately stands out more. And it wouldn't even take more than five minutes really to do that. All you'd have to do is, you know, take a piece of tissue, fold it up into a little square, and just gently blend everything around the dog. And that's just going to make the dog stand out better. Um, let's see. Also, be be careful with the fur direction. So you have a little bit of discrepancy with the direction of the fur. Remember, always go with the flow of the fur. The, you have your lines going this way, whereas you can see the, the dog's fur is changing here. It's changing. So yours is sort of flat here, and it's doing this. Uh, it's pretty close, pretty close here. Um, let's see where else. Yours curling pretty well here. The dog's, yeah, see it changes direction. See it's swooping up, and yours is swooping over. Um, you, I see you mapped out some of the fur direction here, but you didn't really use it. So here you can see the fur is, the fur is pinching here. This is a pinch point because of the, the pose and you don't have any fur doing this. All, all of your fur is doing this. Um, the neck here, pretty difficult to do pretty good on the face though. As far as direction goes, yeah, you, you map this out pretty well. Yeah, this is this is all pretty good, pretty good. Uh, fanning nicely. Remember, it fans around the eye, so be careful with that. Make sure you get those little lines in there. Um, uh, right here on the nose, this is short fur, so you need more dashed lines here, not not long lines. You have long lines from the very beginning. Uh, the fur is really short right here behind the nose, so make sure you um, you do uh, short dashed lines with your pencil when filling it in. Uh, the last thing that I would would recommend is when when establishing the anatomy of the dog, pay a little bit more attention to the broad shapes. So if you look here at his face, if you look here, this is his eye. And this is his other eye, and it's almost like a mask. It's like a mask. If you take that shape and you bring it over here, it would be, yeah, it'd be maybe a little bit bigger, maybe like this size. Yeah, it'd be about that size. If you take this shape, and I'm just going to, let me just grab this black color here, or this dark gray, and I'm just going to fill in this, this shape here a little bit. Let's multiply it. There. There. So all I did was take that exact shape, and you can already see more likeness between the two dogs. So here's without the shape. There, you can't quite recognize the dog in your drawing. The uh, from the photo. And even though you have the nose and the eye in the proper place, because there's such limited information in the photo, you have to make sure that you get these broad shapes correct as well. So the, the other broad shape would be right here around the nose. You can see a little bit of his chin hair being lighter. You have it here. 
but you want to you want that shape to be a bit more obvious and so by establishing those shapes first and then applying your hair texture over top you're going to see a lot more likeness in your pet portraits yep absolutely uh thank you for the submission and came out really well up next is Zayar, and he has this lovely pastel of, of flower. Not sure the, the type of flower. Uh, the leaves here are really, really good. Great, great texture on the leaves. The leaves are sort of stealing the show for me, though. I think um, if a, a couple more layers on the flower, and you're going to have that really nice contrast of the soft, smooth flower, um, I can't really artificially do that in, in a short time, but another layer or two on the flower for sure. Uh, sort of construct a better center here. So the center part of the flower is a little bit ambiguous. And I've seen these flowers before, and I don't think their center looks just like it stops. Like uh, the, the petals are coming in is just sort of stopping. There's no real center to the flower here. So make sure you, you finish that center point of the flower. Really try to create crispy edges around the petals. So if I, maybe I can do that a little bit if I just grab this color. So I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to make the edges of the flowers a bit sharper. By doing this, they're going to stand out more and the flower is just going to look more in focus right now because the edges of the flowers are a bit soft. They're a bit blended into the rest of the background. The, the flower looks a little bit out of focus. So you want to be careful with that. You don't want to have your flower considering it's like the center part of your drawing. You don't want that to be out of focus. So use your pastels here to make sharper edges around the flower. Remember, when doing sharp edges with pastels, it is not about adding more pressure. It's about doing uh, soft, controlled lines. So a little bit more, a uh, little bit more sharpness. So you can see here, this is without the, the sharp edge. This is with the sharp edge. You can just see how it makes the flower uh, stand off the page a bit more. Uh, the other thing that I'm sort of confused by uh, is the color change between this yellow and then the rest of it. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what's the story behind that. It could be in the reference photo, but I would take your artistic license and uh, fix this. Make make the backdrop uniform. Either do like this creamy yellow, which I, I sort of like the darker color better. So I'd actually change this bright yellow more to this like uh, grayish brown type dark color. Uh, the, the other thing that you can do is uh, take your black I'm not going to use pure black. Let me just use like, how dark does this get? Yeah, so I'll just uh, take your black and really, really darken those cast shadows. This is going to make a really big difference as well. So if you if you can get these cast shadows a bit darker, especially like on the leaf here, that's also really going to make that stand out. So you have the cast shadow like here. You can make these a little bit bigger. Don't be afraid to go dark. If you if it's natural light, the cast shadows are like pure black almost. So by enhancing and deepening the cast shadows, you can see that it's going to make the flowers stand out even more. So don't be afraid of the dark um, and uh, uniform background uh, because this may have come from a reference photo most likely. Uh, and even if the reference photo looks like this, you have to ask yourself, does it make, does it look good as artwork? And the answer is it, it could look better if the background was uniform. All right. Uh, thank you, Zyar, for the submission. All right. Up next is Charles. And I didn't realize it, but Charles submitted two projects. And um, 
just to clarify with with everyone that's not in the art club if you're not an art club member you can only submit one project however um i saw charles he had this this portrait and i really wanted to talk about this portrait because it's compositionally really really great and there's some things that um when improved will make this portrait look even better than it already does and then he also submitted this and i just couldn't not talk about this um this is like one of the coolest uh illustrations that i've seen in a while uh, the style and story and everything about it is just so unique and fun that there was just no way um that i could not talk about it so charles you're, you're sort of getting off the hook here uh, by me talking about two projects without being an art club member um but please please sign up to be an art club member <laughs> Because I want to keep seeing more of your work, and I don't want to have to skip any projects that you submit in the future if you submit more than one. Um, so yeah, let's talk about this one first. Uh, truthfully, there is not a whole lot that I would change about this project. I don't know like the full context or story behind everything here. All I know is that I like to look at it, and it's really cool. There's a lot of stuff going on in the background. I'm not. This sort of looks like a fox. In something like fighting or in a boat I'm not quite sure but it's cool detail and I like I like to see that I love the texture now the texture and like the fur of the two animals here the rabbit kind of thing the, the rabbit human hybrid um, the texture is wild like it's super super textured and it adds a really unique aesthetic to it which i like because nothing else in the picture is that textured and it really helps them stand out a lot um, now the only thing that i would like to see done a little bit different is the saturation level of say the blue here the blue is actually good but i think the red could be brighter yeah i think the red here should be should be brighter i'm going to brighten it so I'm going to just grab that and I'm going to go a little bit brighter, a little bit more towards pure red. That's not the color I'm looking for. Let's um, maybe I'll just do it like this. So I'll color everything red and then I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll do it like that. It doesn't need to be extreme, but a little bit brighter red, I think would would make it just pop like i like it looks good like that but i really like the bright red because it really brings a lot of focus to this um and then i'm not sure if any part of this is supposed to be gold uh the bag doesn't quite look gold but the armband maybe that's supposed to be leather i'm not sure um the the necklace piece here the pendant i'm not sure if this is supposed to be gold or or if it's even supposed to be metal at all but you could use the colors from the sky so if i use the colors from the sky because it looks reflective based on the value and then maybe a little bit of like the purple here like right in here and uh yeah this bright yellow there we go the the bright yellow from the sky something like that and then whatever highlight yeah you could you could you want to think about it if it's reflective you want to think about like what's reflecting off of it into your eyes and i would say this the sky here um the other thing is the environment so you want to make sure that your objects they they exist in the light of the environment so we have this bright yellow from the sky or this sort of soft yellow and you have a little bit of it in the uh, fur a bit let me just so I'm going to do it like this and maybe the back here like this and here something something like that and let's go with soft light So you want to bring that that light 
into your objects because that's the world they're existing in right now. So they're existing in this place and the light is going to affect their colors. So here's without and here's with. This is just the light from the yellow sky coming into them. Uh, so make sure you have, um, make sure you utilize that. The, the other thing is that also rocks. The only thing more reflective than water in nature is actually rocks. So you'd, you'd want to have some of your colors from the sky in the rocks. Okay. Cause rocks are, rocks are really reflective. You wouldn't associate with, uh, rocks with reflections, but the, the truth is, uh, all of these colors in the skies, uh, they would exist in these rocks because the rocks are quite smooth. And so the angle that you're looking at, the rocks are going to be reflecting the sky. And also the thing about the sky is, um, softness. So let's just maybe need, maybe here ish. Yeah. Let's blur it like that. And So the, the softness of the sky could also be, I don't know if there was anything in the sky because it sort of looked like there was supposed to be like an animal or, or something with the clouds, but the, the reality is the sky is just too harsh. There's just too much grainy texture and that's just not the way skies look. And if you soften it, you can see how much more focus is pulled into the foreground. So um, just keep that in mind as well. But otherwise this, this project came out really, really nice. I, I liked it a lot. I uh, appreciate the submission and sign up for the art club. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm, let me jump back to chat. Oh, Hey, what's up, Panda? Good to see you. Hey there, Sovereign. Good to see you. Uh, could I clarify again what I mean by pinch points? Thank you. Oh, uh, pinch points is just where the hair comes into a crease or anything comes into a crease, like a sharp, a sharp point. So imagine, um, like a fold in the cloth, like, like, um, the creases, they come to this pinch point, like right here, like all these creases coming in, they come to this pinch point. With clothes, it makes sense because my arm is pinching the cl the cloth. It's literally pinching it. But with hair, you don't generally get those natural pinch points. So when it when it happens in hair, like hair that's just laying there, obviously fur of an animal, there's going to be plenty of pinch points. Uh, I just talked about those with the the dog portrait that Susan did. Um, so that's what I mean by pinch point. Sorry, I'm. It, I have the chat window all the way over to my right, so it's difficult for me to jump back and forth. I'll try not to miss any questions, but <laughs> um, when I'm doing the digital stuff, it's so much harder for me to pay attention to chat. It's it's something that I just, I guess maybe I don't do often enough, um, but yeah, it's so tough. So I apologize for missing anybody's questions or, or missing anybody that came into chat. Um, all right. Anyways, uh, that's all I have to say about this one. Thank you again, Charles, for the submission. And up next is also Charles, and he has this portrait. Uh, this portrait is really, really cool. Great composition, beautiful colors too. I really like the colors here. Now, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about blurriness. So the, the, I think that, um, I think that blurriness would go a long way. Why did nothing change? Filter, blur. Nothing is changing, right? I selected on something. Let me try this one more time. Okay, there we go. Okay, so blurriness, 
um, is something that's difficult to create, but it's it's really, really helpful. So if I do a blur around around the face a little bit. So I'm going to soften some of the hair. I'm going to soften some of the background here. And you can see it it already it sort of brings more focus into the face. So here's before, here's after. It just pulls a little bit more focus to the face. You could even consider blurring the edges of the ears. So if you if you did it this way. And this brings more focus right here to the center of the face. Uh, this is difficult to do if you're doing it from a photo reference and you're copying the photo reference. So uh, this could be difficult to do, but it would be a good challenge if you're up for it. Um, creating that shallow depth of field all by yourself as opposed to having the reference already doing it for you. Somehow, somehow I imagine there is a degree of if I saw the original reference of this, I imagine that there is a pretty obvious degree of shallow depth of field in the original reference. I would be surprised if I was wrong about that, um, just because of the composition. But I, I don't have the original photo, so I, I can't say for sure. But that would be one thing. The The second thing is, I'm not sure what kind of flower this is or what's going on with it. It looks like a weird face monster. <laughs> Doesn't this look like teeth? I'm sorry, but I have to, I have to do this. Um, this to me looks like a monster with two eyes, right? It's got two eyes and two eyes like this and then a mouth that is a circle with teeth that go like this. I don't know what the center of this flower. <laughs> the, the center of this flower is creepy, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just don't know if that's what it's supposed to look like. This is what the center of the flower looks like. <laughs> um, Anyways, yeah, I just had to I just had to draw that really quick because I didn't notice that till now. Um, the flower petals should be smoother, without a doubt. They should be smoother. The flower petal that's like resting on her neck down here looks a lot smoother than the flower itself. Um, so do more layers here and smooth the flower out. The by smoothing out the flower, you're going to First off, make it look more flower-like, and second, it's just going to, it's just going to stand out more in the right way. It's going to stand out in the right way better. So I'm just going to artificially smooth it. This is not going to look fantastic, but um, just by smoothing it, so here's with it being kind of rough, and here's with just a touch of artificial smoothing. Uh, same thing with the stem. The stem here looks a little little light. I'm not sure how what color the stem's supposed to be, but the stem also looks a little rough. Uh, if you if you could smooth that out as well, that would look better. Uh, especially with the desaturation of the skin. These saturated, so this is the saturation contrast that I was talking about uh, previously on Susan's graphite project. She obviously didn't have saturation because there was no it was there was no chroma in the picture here the the skin is very pale and washed out where the flower is really bold and bright so uh use that to your advantage to make those saturations very vibrant and stand out from the background now this you ask uh you mentioned on facebook that you know a lot of people like this you weren't really sure why well i can tell you because contrast uh, the number, the most important thing in your artwork is contrast, period. Uh, when you have anonymous viewers look at artwork, if you were to have anonymous viewers look at, you know, 10, 10 pictures or whatever, 
and vote on which one they thought was best. They are going to pick the one that has the greatest degree of value. And I don't mean monetary value. I mean the, the contrast, the overall contrast. So that's saturation contrast, that's value contrast, that's texture contrast. Here, I added the blur to the background to give you a variety of texture contrast. I enhanced the colors of the poppy, as some people are mentioning that it it's poppy. Um, I increased the saturation of the poppy flower to contrast the dull, subdued saturation of the skin. So um, that gives you all three contrasts because you already had the dark values. You already had really dark values and really bright values. So that's value contrast. I gave you the blur, which gave you textural contrast. And then I gave you brighter flower for the saturational contrast. So you're utilizing all three of the saturation um, or all three of the types of contrast. Uh, same thing with the eye. You can add some more green into the eye. Um, but um, yeah, anyways. So those are the those are the things that I would probably uh, work on a bit with this particular portrait. Now, I'm not gonna get into the skin because I've done way too many tutorials on skin, but I think artistically, this this works really well, having the pale washed out skin. Uh, so there's no really need to, to discuss it because I think that you did a good job on it. Uh, the eye could just be a little bit better. The iris is a, a little wonky. Um, now, keep make sure the pupil's there, and then um, when you're filling in, oops, when you're filling in your eye with color, make sure you're always working in this direction, okay? So fan out like this, and that's going to give you the, the, the iris texture. Yeah. And so here's the before, here's the after. Here's without the blurry, here's with the blurry. So all, all of those things um, would greatly improve this portrait. Otherwise, it uh, yeah it looks really good. Thank you again for the submission. Up next is Cindy. Uh, Cindy, I chose this project that you submitted. Uh, you submitted a lot of projects, but I you're you're you were also not a an art club member, uh, and I also did the um, uh, the critique on Wednesday of your uh, bowl of spaghetti slash dog. So um, I I chose this one, and I I chose this one. Uh, because everything about it is really, really well done, except for one particular aspect. Uh, well, two particular aspects. Um, and I'm going to discuss those two aspects, because here, beautiful texture, a lovely technique with your colored pencils. Like, there's so many unique textures going on here. You have glass, you have pattern, you have whatever this texture is. I'm not sure what this bucket exactly is, but the texture on it is really cool. It's really, really complex, and um, a lot of work obviously went into creating the texture of this bucket. You have these holes for the um, colander. Uh, you have the, the pit of the peach here. Um, texture on the leaf. The, you have the wood grain texture. So you have all the textures in the world here. They're all done really, really well. So I don't even have to discuss any of that because you 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 knocked all that all of that out of the park. Now the two things that they drive me nuts about this picture because I think if they were fixed, this it would just look amazing. It would look so amazing, and I would have nothing nothing to say, um, nothing negative to say about it. Um, the first thing is, well, actually, before I say it, um, there's two things. There's two things that I've talked about endlessly many, many times. Uh, in chat, I want I want people to tell me what those two things are, because I, I, I want you to be able to see it as well. So um, everyone in chat, tell me the two things that are incorrect. Um, using, it, it should just be two words, 
So I don't need like a paragraph explanation. It's two words. So I'm going to give you guys like two minutes to come up with the two words that describe what's wrong with this project. Hey there, sneaks. Speckleware. Oh, well, it, it's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's really cool texture. You did a fantastic job on it. So draw Izzle says that it's very beautiful, but misses shadows and depth. Perspective and proportion. That's that's pretty good. Okay, John says values question <laughs> mark. Shadow and depth. Oh hey there, Chandri. Good to see you. Shadows on one side. Okay, I'm 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 seeing a lot of shadows. Okay, shadows. Um shadows is a word. Perspective and contrast. Okay. I've I've gotten a couple perspectives. All right, the two words that I'm looking for here, and I very good guesses from some of you. Um the first one is perspective. 100%. Um this is meant to be three-dimensional, but unfortunately, because the perspective is so mushed together, uh, it, it, it forces you to see it as a two-dimensional drawing. And let me show you what I mean here. So I'm going to just, let me just fade this down a little bit, okay, so you can see my lines more clearly. So Perspective is obviously a extremely important thing. So if I build the perspective of the colander here, how, where's my line? Okay. Can never see my brush. So here's the bottom of the colander, right? And then it cones up and meets the other part. And the bowl here, here's the bowl. Sorry, that's a terrible line. Try drawing with a mouse. Right here's the bowl, and here's the open part of the bowl. Right, the the bowl, the top of the bowl is a circle. Right, which means in perspective it becomes an ellipse. So here's the ellipse for the top. Here's the ellipse for the bottom. And then now let's put the bucket in. The bucket comes down to here, curves, comes up to here. It's pretty flat but it's still correct, right? Because here's the opening of the bucket. I'm not going to do the lid, right? The only problem is that colander cannot exist without simultaneously intersecting the bucket because the plane, let's do, let's do the ground in blue. So hypothetically, the vanishing point or the horizon line would be about here. Right. And so from the center point, you have this line coming out and then you have the plane of the table or the surface that it's setting on. Right. Oops. Okay. So here's the table surface in perspective. Right. And this is difficult to visualize. But we have to we have to assume that both the bucket and the colander, and I'm not even getting to the jar of peaches. I, I assume it's a jar of peach or peaches. We have to assume that the colander and the bucket are both sitting on the same plane. However, if they are indeed sitting on the same plane, the colander is is simultaneously behind and in front of the bucket based off of the elliptical surface that is sitting on the the table or the ground or wherever it's sitting. So the ellipse of the colander is behind the ellipse of the bucket, which puts the, the colander behind the bucket However, it's also in front of the bucket. 
So there's this intersection. And when, when you view this, when you view this as it is, you, a lot of people might not be able to recognize immediately what's going on here. They, they'll be like, there's something feels weird, but I just don't know what it is. Well, our brains understand perspective because our eyes naturally see in perspective. Our perspective is just the way we visualize the world. And so when we are trying to replicate that visually on a two-dimensional surface, it can be a little tricky. And when we do it this way, where uh, perspectively it does just flat out doesn't work, our brains are like, well, I'm looking at something. It looks really nice because I, like every, like I said, everything here looks really, really nice. It's just the perspective is just so, so impossible. It's sort of, it's almost an optical illusion uh, because the colander is both behind and in front of the bucket. It's like, uh, it's like existing in two places at once. Um, the bucket and the uh, jar of peaches here work a little bit better now the jar of peaches is still pushed into the bucket a little bit and needs to be brought forward, but um, it's really it's really the colander in the bucket that is the biggest perspective discrepancy here. The second thing, so the first word that I was looking for when I was asking everyone was was perspective, um, and a number of you got it. The second thing, the second thing is light. So, or lighting. So the first word is perspective. The second word I was looking for was lighting. A lot of people talked about shadows. And the shadows, that's, yeah, I mean, we think of shadows when we're thinking of lighting. Just remember that it's lighting and not shadows, okay? Um, Oh yeah, yeah, that's also possible, Tina. <laughs> the 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 bucket is perfectly cut out right where the colander is. Yeah. Um so what I'm looking for is lighting. So uh, what I mean, what's what's happening here is see this shadow? This is a cast shadow. Cast shadows tell us exactly where the light source is we can tell that the light source is coming from here because the only way to get this cast shadow is if light is coming from here hitting this handle thingy and then casting that shadow against the bucket so there's the light source however if you look at the colander the light source is coming from here because this is the the form shadow this is the form shadow of the colander. Everything on the right side is dark. And while the jar of peaches exists in a vacuum because there is no there is no form shadow, there is no there is no cast shadow. There's there's nothing on the peaches or there's nothing on the jar of peaches to tell us anything about light. The the peaches here sort of feels like the light source is coming. Sorry, that's a terrible arrow. The, the peaches sort of look like the light source is coming from here because you have a little bit of a cast shadow here. And it seems like a little bit of a cast shadow under them. So we have three different light sources, not to mention we have these highlights here. You know, technically this light source and this light source can be the same. So these could be the same light source um, creating these same form shadows. So it's the... It's the lighting that's also um, in, incorrect here. And if the perspective and the lighting were corrected, I cannot simply do that digitally in 10 minutes or even an hour. Um, so I'm not going to uh, or even try. So if, if the, the perspective and the lighting were fixed, this project would just be flawless. It would look, it would look just that much better it already looks really good okay don't don't misunderstand me in any way it already looks really really good and there's a lot of there's a lot of famous artwork um that you know hangs in museums that have 
perspective and lighting discrepancies. So it's not even it's not even something that you have to completely concern yourself about, but th it exists here. And being aware of it is the first step to correcting it. So um, anyways, that is uh, that is the two things that I wanted to t talk about in this project. Okie dokie. Uh, up next, I uh, have John. He did a digital painting here. Uh, and this is a fantastic um, digital painting. John has been working with his digital painting for less than a year, I think. It hasn't even been that long. I mean, I, I think we're just talking a few months or whatnot. Uh, he's posted a few digital paintings in Discord over the past few months, uh, and he's progressively getting uh, much, much better. This is by far one of his best digital paintings that I've personally come across. And I don't know if he's still in chat. John, if you're still in chat, let me know, um, because I had a few questions. Um, the accuracy... Now, when it comes to color, color accuracy in digital work, it's, it's pretty simple, you know, because uh, you have the one-to-one -one comparison there, uh, and you can measure them equally. Now, uh, some good texture. Now, just about a year? Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's not too long, though. That's not too long. This is really good. Um, did you work in? Did you work in separate layers? That's my first question. Or did you paint this on a single layer? Yeah, puffins are adorable. Um, all right, so the going back to the texture. So in the reference photo, you can clearly see the background has no texture. You created texture in the background for no reason. Um, so I would avoid that. Avoid. Avoid adding texture where it's not, where there's no texture. Okay, so smooth out the background. Uh, if you worked in layers, okay, 10 layers in all, okay. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, the reason I was asking is because the, um, I guess it'd be wheat, maybe it's wheat that's up in the front here. I'm wondering if you painted the wheat on a separate layer and then just gave it a blur uh, because that's the way that I would have done it. I would have grabbed like this color here and yeah, I would have just grabbed this color here, taken my brush and went boop, 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 something like that. And then I would have went up here to filter, Gaussian blur, and I just blur it until I get the shape that I want. <laughs> and I just be like, yeah, yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that's the reason I'm asking. I wasn't, wasn't sure if that's the way that you did it or you actually tried to to paint that blurry. Uh, if you try to paint that blurry, I'm sorry, you shouldn't have. Because <laughs> I just did it in um, like five seconds, um, scribbling a line. So uh, I, I've been doing digital art for a really, really, really long time. So I, I know a couple of secrets. Okay, you blurred it on another layer. Perfect. I'm not sure if you're following a tutorial or, or whatnot. Um, so yeah, the texture in the background and then you need to start bringing in the texture where texture exists. So first thing, let's look at the beak. Look at the subtle textures here. So uh, look at the whatever this goofy thing is. So if I take this dark orange and I just bring it over here. So you have some of it, right? But you don't, you're missing this yellow. I think that's what it is. And so you need, you need some of these yellow spots here and some hard lines okay and then um i'm just going to take like this color smaller brush and create some of the the wrinkles that exist here so there's there's a few wrinkles and i'm, I'm not looking at the reference as you can see but uh there's just a few wrinkles there and by adding that by adding that texture into it it's going to just get more detailed also look at the separation of the beak like yours is far too soft there's a hard line here. There's a hard line here. See that hard line? There's also a hard line on the other side. Now I'm doing this really quickly. I would expect better from you. 
I mean cleaner lines here. So you use those hard lines. Um, you have a hard line here separating, I don't know, I guess this is like the back of the eyebrow or something. I don't know what this is, but there's a hard line there. So use that hard line to your advantage, create that texture. Um, there's some hard lines here in the fur. So you have some, you have some more texture through here, right? Just follow the direction of the, uh, the fur or the feathers rather. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of a hard line right here, maybe a little bit of a hard line there. Um, this is too light down here. So see how dark this is? This is like dark brown and yours is like peach colored. So there's a huge, huge difference in value there that you want to be careful of. So right in here, it's a little bit, a little bit more brown right there on the beak. Um, there's a bit of blue. So I'm going to just grab the blue here. There's a bit of blue in the beak right, right in here, See that blue. There's also a um, touch of blue. You got some blue. Yeah, you got a little bit of blue in the feathers down here. So uh, utilize those background colors. Reuse, reuse. Uh, there's some more blue. You got. I see the blue that you added around the eye. There's a bit more blue here in the transition. Don't forget your transition colors. There's a little bit of blue here. Um, maybe even a bit more yellow from the... Uh, uh, from the wheat here, there's quite a bit of yellow here. Uh, so you have nice yellows and browns coming into the fur here, but make sure when you add, make sure when you add your uh, sort of subtle toning colors that you don't lighten it. So you still need to go, you still need to go dark here on the cheek. Like it's still a dark value. Try to balance out the the subtle colors that peak in uh, and the uh, the values okay so you don't want to you don't want to go lighter uh, where you need to be darker also right here like right above the eye there's like a little patch of darkness um, through here uh, uh, the so you have salt and pepper texture here so salt and pepper texture is really really easy Salt and pepper texture, and let me just draw it like this. Um, is there a blank spot? Okay, let's just, so salt and pepper texture is this. Okay, it's mountains. And then you do another mountain and you crisscross them. Okay, this is how you get salt and pepper texture. Okay, remember that? And so you have salt and pepper texture here. So it just goes mountain, mountain, now these mountains have to go in the direction of the fur or that the feathers, right? Feathers, fur, whatever. So it's just mountain ranges in that direction. And you see, see the, and I'll draw the, let me show you where the mountain, uh, where the mountains actually exist here in the reference. So you can see boop, 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 mountain, 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 zigzag, zigzag. Do you see it? Do you see it yet? Zigzag, zigzag. Now it's, it, it's easy for me to see it because I've been doing this for so long, but do you see the mountain ranges? Anyways, that's, that's the, uh, the texture there. So it's just mountain ranges. Anything can be broken down into a pattern, even when a pattern doesn't exist. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, this is fantastic work regardless. Um, yeah, just, yeah, keep, keep up the good work. Uh, and don't be afraid to create some of your hard lines. Yeah, the mountains things really work, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like magic. Trust me, when I, uh, nobody taught me that, by the way, uh, the, the mountain things. Um, the, the mountain thing is when I used that about five years ago, I needed to find a way to teach people how to do salt and pepper fur. And I was like, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a way to do this. And I was looking at the pattern. I was just, I was analyzing the pattern on a squirrel 
And uh, eventually I was like, can I just, can I just scribble mountains and repeat that pattern? And I did it and I was like, that's salt and pepper fur, easy beasy. Like it just works and it's just scribbles. Yeah. Anyways, uh, up next is just the three submissions, two from Linda and one from Diane for the monthly masteries. Uh, if you don't know what the monthly masteries are, uh, do them first off. I, I only got Linda and Diane here. Um, make sure you do the monthly masteries. You know, you got all month to do them. Join the art club if you want to join in on the monthly masteries. But essentially, they are what I'm... I call them monthly masteries. They're just simple still life projects for you to either get better at drawing if you want to draw them, or you can just recreate your own line art by tracing. However you want to do it, doesn't matter. And it's about mastering the mediums that you're working with. Now, in this case, Linda did two in colored pencil and then Diane also did colored pencil. So I have two here from Linda. She did this on different surfaces. This is like the, um, um, I can't remember. This is like a smooth plasticky polyester. That's it. Um, surface, uh, looks really, really unique. Um, but anyways, this is just regular paper here, uh, both in colored pencils. And like I said, the monthly masteries are just projects that I put on the art club, uh, for you to work on the precision, whether it's your layering, your your patience, your your accuracy, uh, and and values. So the idea uh, with the monthly masteries, you have six values, and then you uh, look at the reference photo and you you focus on the filling in the shapes of the values with the associated zero through five values, and. We're up to the point where everything that is a gradient becomes a gradient. So cast shadows now have feathered gradient edges. Um, and then, of course, we have reflections and highlights. Uh, and start with the first monthly mastery and then catch up going through each monthly mastery uh, and follow the instructions that I have on the website. But um, up to this point, we are doing everything except for texture. So everything should be really smooth and filled in and there should be no texture because all of these objects are wood, but you can't tell they're wood because there's no texture put into it yet. And so they, they should look smooth like this, um, really smooth. Now the, the gradient here on the cast shadow should be a little bit softer because we are doing gradients in the cast shadows now actually all the gradients here should be softer uh, these are all a little bit too hard but um they they look good they look good now your uh your uh shadows here on like the cone the half sphere uh the sphere and this hexagon a gram whatever it's called i have no idea what this is called um hexaprism uh they are too light. Uh, the zero value I see clearly here, like that's, but the two or the one, I mean, the one needs to be the next darkest and I'm just not seeing it. These, these sides are just too bright here. So be, be careful with having your shadows too, too bright because the shadows are just too bright. Uh, this one's quite a bit better. I can see the values a lot better. Uh, they just need to be softened. The The gradients need to be softer. So really focus on, really, really focus on the fundamentals because that's the whole purpose of the monthly masteries is to focus on the fundamentals. And in this case, the gradients. And then uh, Diane, yours, <clears throat> yours came out quite well. Your sphere is a little, little mis misshapen, just a touch. Um, also this reflection, this reflection on the bottom is too bright. This reflection is brighter than the highlighted side of the sphere. So this is just a bit too bright. So be careful with that. Uh, again, the, the gradients, um, should be softer because this, 
this edge that you almost create here turns this cone almost in more into a, a, a pyramid like this. So be careful with these edges where your gradient should be softer. And then um, also your cast shadows should be uh, softer as well around the edges. So we are, everything that is a gradient becomes a gradient. Uh, the cast shadows are no longer strong shapes with sharp edges. They, they should be, I, I believe I mentioned that. Let me make sure I did. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, I just have to go to my website really quick. I gotta, I gotta make sure that I mentioned it. Oh, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Uh, in the directions number three, use gradients to soften edges of cast shadows. So the cast shadows here. Um, they are sharp, but there's they're not this they're not this sharp. They should be a little bit softer. Let me just double check the reference photo really quick as well. Yeah, so the edge here is is quite soft. Right here, it's hard, and then it becomes a little bit softer. And then the one from the pyramid is is rather strong like this, but. Yeah, for sure this part here should be more of a gradient. But they they came out good. I'm I'm being nitpicky because, you know, it is it's important to be nitpicky on uh the fundamentals. All right. I'll thank you so much Tina for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Uh, who did who did um, Professor McGonagall? That was Dorothy. Yeah, Dorothy did that. This uh, this one here. Yeah, this is Dorothy's piece. Uh, that is it, by the way. That is uh, the final final project to go over. So thank you guys so much for all the lovely submissions. I wonder if I can wake up Udon. I don't think he, I don't think he's gonna wake up. I actually um I forgot to mention uh, Udon. He finished his his shed uh, Tuesday night, so he's all fresh and bright and stuff now. Um. And I actually, I took, I took Udon for his first walk, uh, yesterday. It was really, really warm after my wife came home and, uh, we took, we took a nice little walk around and I just carried him. I mean, obviously I didn't put a leash on him and like <laughs> make him slither behind me or anything. That would be hilarious. But no, I took him for a walk. He, he does not like cars. Yeah. He's not a fan of cars. Uh, I was holding him. I was holding him like this for a while and he was periscoping. He would, he had his little head up like this and he was like looking around and sniffing and stuff. Um, but then a car drove by and he, he balled up. And so I, I kept him, I kept him like closed up like this and he just have his little head poking out looking around. But every time a car came by, he would like, he'd ball back up. But anyways, yeah, I just wanted to share that little tidbit with all of you. Um, thanks again for all the submissions. You guys have a fantastic weekend. Uh, I'll see you on Monday for the pastel project. We're going to continue on that. And, um, yeah, uh, uh, for anyone that this might be new to, I do these live critiques every first Friday of the month. So today's Friday the first. So this is the live critique for July. The next one will be in August, so the first Friday of August. Um, although I have a I have a chess tournament happening in August, so I I might miss the first Friday. I'm not 100 sure, but anyways, uh, more info on that. But yeah, just uh, 
Just make sure you stick around for the next one, and I'll see you on Monday. Take care. Peace.